Hello, I'm Eric Meyer, a developer advocate at Agalia. And I am Brian Cardell, also a developer advocate at Agalia. And uh, this week, we're going to talk about the recent CSS Working Group face-to-face meeting. Um, we've done uh, an episode like this before. And uh, one of the reasons that we do these episodes is that when the Working Group gets together for a few days, they discuss a lot of things. And often stuff that works best at a whiteboard with a bunch of people in a room are saved for these face-to-face meetings. And that's sometimes where fairly important things get worked out. Sort of everybody in the room figuring out, okay, if we do this, then there's this effect. And then if we do the other thing, there's that effect and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we thought we'd sort of review the high points of sort of the big decisions that were made to let uh, everyone out there in listener land know what's going on with the working group. Yeah, it's kind of fun to recap these uh, because there's a little bit of, um, I think, people don't really know what happens in them. Like, I think there's not a lot of people who are, you know, super well positioned to give a breakdown. So, yeah, right. let's do it. Let's yeah. Do and, you know, Brian and I are both members of the working group um, as Agalia representatives. We are not the only ones. Oriol uh, from Agalia was there physically in person. He's the editor of on uh, CSS Grid. Yeah, Stephen Chenny from also from Agalia was there remotely as well, and a bunch of uh, people from Google, Apple. There was a representative from Mozilla. Uh, I can't remember if anyone showed up in person from Microsoft, but they were definitely on the call. Yeah, that's an interesting thing too. That I don't, you know, before I got involved with CSS Working Group, about I can't believe it's been like a decade already. <laughs> I've been on CSS Working Group, but. Before I got involved, I, you know, I didn't know what one of these was like, and I don't know that people talk about them so much. Like, what is it like, the size and the composition? So maybe we can say that we try to meet in person four times a year, and we always have had ability for remote participation somehow. Sometimes it's not been so good, but since COVID, it's it's gotten a lot better. People really appreciate the remote. Yeah, so... So, so what is it like? Let's talk about that real quick. So, yeah. Uh, so what is it like, Brian? Like, what's it like in person? Sort of so or... boring. It's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's, uh, so it's usually three, sometimes four days. Okay. Uh, we try to rotate where we meet. Mm. This one was hosted in Google in California. Yeah. And, uh, we'll have another one in June that will be hosted out of Gallia. Yay. Woo. Yep. Um, In Spain. A Coruña. Yeah. yeah. So we try to meet four times a year, but it relies on people being able to agree on times and places and then finding a host. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not as easy as you would think. Um, Yeah. It's not like W3C has offices all around the world where you could just be like, oh, we're going to go crash the, this office, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and just rotate around that way. Um, It's more like, member companies a few times a year we say like okay who wants to (laughs) could apple do it could google do it could adobe do it you know um right could microsoft do it could yeah right could agalia do it could you know whoever right because the host has to like feed people during the day doesn't necessarily have to feed them 24 7 but there's like a breakfast service and a lunch service and There's coffee for people to be able to stay awake if they do find a particular conversation not of interest. Yeah, and like when a galley hosted, we had childcare even. Yeah, it it is a little bit of a commitment. Not to mention you need to have access to facilities that will host, let's say, 20 people in a room and give decent remote access so that the people who are remote can hear uh, what's being discussed. and. Even more ideally, if there's going to be work at the whiteboard, that the people who are remote can see the whiteboard. Yeah, um, which was kind of a problem for the beginning of this one. It, yeah, the first day there was there was a little bit of a problem with that, but they they had to sort it sorted out by the second day. Um, so let's talk about some of the big points. There was a big discussion about colors, which I thought was both interesting and also at the same time I was like, wow, how did we even get here? So fascinating how spicy it got right like yeah it did get a little spicy um you know not in a people attacking each other personally kind of way but just like someone would sort of explain their position and then someone else would say there were things that were factually incorrect in what you just said and then they would explain and then the why they felt that and the other person would say 
you know, that wrong and it, yeah. it got a little spicy. But what fascinated me was we've gotten to a point now in CSS with the newer color syntaxes like OKLCH and OKLAB and, and some others where it's very easy to specify a color that's outside of the display range of common monitors, or for that matter, you can specify color points that are outside the range of human visual perception. And that was kind of the point where I was like, wait, what are we doing? Where you can specify colors that are, to the human eye, literally impossible. Like it would be infrared? I don't know. <laughs> it's, you know. We're talking about some things here that are, you know, there are people who have like masters and doctorates and like mm. a decade, two decades worth of experience in colors. Right. These are people who just, they're dedicated so much of their life to colors and understanding colors. So they're having conversations that are like a little bit outside my uh, a little bit outside our range of understanding but yeah. i mean what the discussion was really about was okay so you if you define a color that can't be displayed like you've defined a color that not even display p3 can handle because mm -hmm. it's just so far outside of that color space then what do browsers do like how do they quote unquote clip that how do they constrain that what is the color that should be shown that the display can produce and depending, like there was an example that showed if you do it this way, you get this color, but if you do it this other way, you get this other color and they look very different, right? Yeah. They're both maybe shades of purple, but one is light dusky purple and the other one is super intense, close to neon purple. And which one is the one that browser should do? <laughs> and yeah. that was part of what got contentious was some people were saying, well, you should do this. And other people say, well, we should do that. Each had very defensible reasons for why they thought that, but mm. they didn't agree. <laughs> yeah. And it's fascinating in a way. I mean, for a real long time on the web, we were used to, well, for a real long time, we had 216 colors that wouldn't get dithered. And that was what we dealt with. That was part of the longer stretch of time where computers had basically what we now call sRGB display, and you could only define RGB colors color syntaxes were basically constrained by the hardware of the time. But now there's been a lot of work done to have colors be device independent. So you're supposed to get the same color basically regardless of the device. The point being that using one of these newer color spaces like, okay, LAB or whatever, I want this super intense green. Like I want the green that they put on ambulances. You might then send that page to a monitor that can't produce that exact shade of green. So now what? Yeah, I mean, I I wrote this article on like unlocking colors in 2019, I think. And like I was having a conversation with I think Chris Coyer and Dave Rupert trying to explain why I was excited about this and why I thought it was important. Mm -hmm. You know, I was trying to explain and I was giving analogies like, okay, so when I first got started with computers, you had um, your choice of an amazing array of two colors, black yeah. and white, right? Mm -hmm. Or green and white. Amber or, and amber, white. or amber and black. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, amber was my, amber was mine. I had amber. So green and black or amber and black or you know, some were blue and black. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, binary. It was binary, right? And so Pretty like, much, yeah. That works great if you can reduce everything down to a binary, but most things in life are somewhere in the middle range. So there's not really a good way to make a binary representation of an image that looks really a lot like the image, right? I mean, it's yeah. going to look pretty bad. And then we got to like 16 colors and then we got to like 64 colors, 256 colors. You know, every time you're able to you know, make approximations somehow. But like the way that you do those approximations is like really fascinating. The way that you store the information and then the way that you recall it to the screen. And then the fact that people always have different screens, right? Like, so it's always been a matter of like, how do you store the information? How do you do the math? And then the fact that everybody's setup and hardware capabilities even is different. And so like, how do you display something that looks like the designer intended and yeah. you know like i i like to think about it like like pantone cards right 
Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. a lot of people are seeing, or, or like uh, when you go to the paint store, you know, right. Like you go to the, and like you go pick out a bunch of swatches and then you like bring them home and you're like, wow, that looks nothing like I thought it would right. look yeah. in my room in my lighting. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. and then you pick a color and then you paint with it and you start painting and you're like, wow, that looks so much different than I imagined. <laughs> right. right? Um, did I make a mistake? Yeah. yeah. And, or, or did they make a mistake when they mixed it or something? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah. so we, you know, when this gets into like these, especially like super saturated colors, very intense colors that we couldn't do before mm-hmm. that maybe can't even be displayed on, you know, really high end equipment there's clipping that occurs and like, how do you do that? And it's going to look probably very much not like you intended. We're way down into the weeds on colors. Yeah, no, but that that's what the discussion was. It was way down into the weeds on colors. And it reminds me a little bit of the act of translation. I've been reading RF Quang's uh, Babel, which was a fantasy type novel that was published a couple of years ago. It's basically about translation and the act of translation from one language to another and like what gets lost and how do you deal with the fact that if I'm translating from German, there are words in German that there's no equivalent word in English. And it's, it's not even easy necessarily in English to express exactly what that word encapsulates. And so if you're going to translate poetry, for example, do you get it technically correct, even though that sounds maybe really weird? Or do you, do you try to make it true to the spirit of the original, even if you have to really change the phrasing that's used? And, you know, the, there's no right answer. And this feels the same to me. There's a color that cannot be expressed in this user's environment. What is the most faithful, quote unquote, recreation of what the author was trying to do? I think it basically came down to, we don't have a resolution yet. Yeah. There's- and And... Like we have to move on because we're only yeah. on the very first thing, but right. But like there were other aspects of this that had to do with like it's not just is this good or is this bad, but it's like in these different cases, right? So like these these spaces, like OK Lab, OK mm-hmm. LCH, they're very good for interpolation, right? Because like as you mm-hmm. move through the space, it's perceptually uniform. But like, should you use it as straight up display this color? You know. Right. And that's maybe you could have different opinions on those two things, basically. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. should you use it for interpolation or should you convert to it for interpolation? Right. Yeah. That that was definitely part of it. I I shouldn't say there were no resolutions around color. There were a a few, but they weren't about this stuff. So one of them was, for example, all HSL values have to clip to non-negative numbers for the saturation. Apparently there are situations now where that maybe you can get negative saturation numbers, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. Apparently the cross fade and color mix uh, functional values had different serialization orders. Mm-hmm. So those are going to be made consistent. And uh, I guess in selection pseudo elements, author colors weren't necessarily being respected. So uh, there was a resolution to like literally put in the spec. If the author has supplied colors, you need to respect them in selection pseudo elements. These are sometimes the things that the working group deals with because when when a specification is written, maybe there are bits that are should have been stated explicitly but weren't. And then when somebody goes to implement, like actually do an implementation of the specification, they discover, oh, I followed what the spec says, and now I've encountered these situations, which you know are admittedly rare, but there's still this possibility and what does the working group think should happen here? You know, these are the kinds of issues that often get brought to the working group just for, for clarification, really. So those are the things that happen with colors. But yes, you're right. We need to move on because we're already some ways into this. Uh, view transitions dominate yeah. a lot of the stuff on, on Monday. And that's like, it's a really interesting idea that I, I'm really looking forward to. Mm-hmm. And I have myself put on my website uh, the simplest version of that, which is just like a meta tag that just says, like, go ahead, you can do this sort of like default animation on my site, which is sort of like crossfade in between. But, you know, it only works in basically like Canary, I think, with the flag on. So, like, nobody's seeing it except me. <laughs> 
and right. you know like six other people probably but uh i have not been following it because we've talked about this before you know the how close do you follow these things like the cost of doing it is like 900 times what people will pay in the end because yeah. you're paying attention to all the very deep details and the the gross churn and everything so uh, i've not been following this super closely to be honest you know a, li a little bit of a unofficial signal to me at least that i should probably pay more attention to it now yeah so I thought it was really interesting and so many details in these things right. uh, as they go. Yeah, because, I mean, basically the way view transitions work, just to sort of clarify a little bit, a view transition is you have a, a bunch of, let's say, cards. Like you're on Amazon, let's say. With view transitions, what you would be able to do is click on one of those cards, one of those little, you know, like things in the catalog listing, and then it will, like, zoom out and fill your screen and then suddenly you'll have a full page. And so the way that that works is basically the browser takes a screenshot of the page before the view transition starts and a screenshot of the final page afterwards and then somehow blends from one to the other. And there, there are different ways to do it. And so that gets in, I mean, it's kind of an animation, <laughs> but yeah. it's an animation between one web view and another web view instead of animations now are you can change the color of a thing or you can change the size of a thing, but you're not switching from one page to another. Yeah. Or all from... animations are within the Dom, right? Right. So you have some Dom that has to be in the page and also has to be displayed somehow. Like it, it needs to, to create a block in the first place or else you can't animate it. <laughs> right. It's exactly. a whole other, you know, issue that's well, been dragged on for years and years and years. Yeah, and they did actually talk about things like, okay, so I have display block and display none, and I want to animate from one to the other. Can that be done? Yeah. And there's actually been work in that direction. But anyway, view transitions got talked about a lot because there is a hierarchy in CSS where like animations can overrule other things, right? They can have a higher weight or that sort of thing. And there are events that fire so that you can listen for them in JavaScript uh, or that sort of thing, or you can fire them from JavaScript to start uh, an animation. And so figuring out how view transitions, where you're literally going from one DOM to another DOM, possibly. Like, how does all that fit together? Like, what is the exact timing of where these events fire and those events fire and if something changed, you know, is, is kind of the same between the two, but it's changed in these ways, like how does that get dealt with? And so there was a, there was a lot of that, but that's actually, I think it's a good signal, like you said, because it means that instead of the discussion being how conceptually is this going to work? It's now, all right, we figured out how it's supposed to work, but now we're getting down into the weeds of like nitty gritty. How exactly does this interact with these other things? You know, I think it goes to that thing that I was saying in the beginning, where it's like, you know, I have not been following this very closely because like everyone else, I only yeah. have so many hours in the day. Exactly. And so when people from multiple organizations are suddenly getting way down into the weeds, like we have like nine different, maybe nine or 10 different resolutions that were made on view transitions that are getting all, you know, a lot of really deep thought that's about what happens when there's like an iframe and this thing mm -hmm. is like off screen and yep. then you call get computed style. <laughs> like there's all kinds of very, people have been thinking about this deeply now and that means that they're investing the time. Yep. So it's like a signal that people are willing to invest the time as opposed to just talking about the theory and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's really cool, but I don't, I don't think that we should go through like the nine different, um, no. they're very in the weeds. Yeah, I, I think another, maybe the most exciting thing that happened on Monday was um, we agreed to start an editor's draft for CSS mixins and CSS custom functions. Yep. Uh, this had been proposed by uh, Miriam Suzanne, Mia, as she goes by uh, on the yeah. on the intertubes and who was recently a guest here. She had proposed basically mixins. So sort of like macros in a sense for yeah, those who like, are familiar with macros. It's like, here's this, here's this bag of stuff. And then somewhere else in the style sheet, you can say, you can point at that bag and say, those things, bring those yeah, here. Exactly. Like pretend that I copied and pasted them right here. Yeah. 
which have been features of preprocessors for a very yeah. long time. And here's the interesting thing. I don't care about mixing. <laughs> I'm more excited about the custom functions part because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, going all the way back to like the Houdini and all that, like this is again, why I have got into and why I pressed on a bunch of the things. So we have had custom functions on the list for a really long time of things that we wanted to do. And this isn't the custom functions that we started with. But if you were to like rewind all the way back to like 2010 or something like that, we had some ideas like tab had a spec that was getting into some of these things. It was like very, very early draft sort of thing. And uh, Mia has put forward like a better proposal to get started that would allow you to sort of say, here's a way that you can define this thing as like an at rule that's like, here's where some complicated math happens. And you can just give that a name. And then you can use that complicated math elsewhere in your style sheet by just saying here and here are the values that you plug into the, to the formula. And right. also the way that it's designed really opens the door for us to create like custom functions of the other two kinds that I think we have talked about in the past that would be like, maybe this is a worklet that you register and it can do like maybe more complicated things than you could do initially with the approach that we have here. Um, so I, yeah, I'm really excited because I think this is a way that you can sort of extend CSS. So you could make some custom functions that are really complicated mm -hmm. and then you can just share those, right? Mm -hmm. Which is awesome for me because what I want is like people like on a tutor who, you know, just blow my mind with the things that they do to be like, here's the custom function that does this thing that everybody wants to do. And you like you then you can just grab it and you could use it and you could be like i don't need to know how to do that super complicated thing because i know smart people <laughs> <laughs> right so yeah. like a basic example of a custom function would be something like you could write a custom function that would round decimal values to two places sure i mean you could maybe figure out how to do now but would take nested calcs and stuff like that and Instead, you take all those nested calcs, you put them in one place, make the make it a custom function, and then from then on, you can say, you know, round two, or maybe you can even say round, you know, value, comma, number of decimal places, and it will send you back what you're looking for, which maybe there are situations where that would be super useful, but it, I'm just, I'm trying to use it as a sort of a basic example of, here's a thing you could do. And like right. you say, it could be way more complicated. You could create a custom function where you supply it a color and it returns randomly sort of procedurally generated snowflake, you know, whatever. The resolution was to start an editor's draft of this. So this is still like at the early stages. This is the, we have conceptually agreed that this should be part of CSS. Let's have Mia, in this case, write a draft specification that we can all then look at and say, you know, well, what about this? What about that? I, I did see some people say, well, I can already do this in a mix-in. Why do I care? Like where you get a real benefit. This this is the reason that we took so long to get even variables, you know, and we didn't mm -hmm. get variables. What we got is CSS custom properties. And like we very specifically called them CSS custom properties right. because they're really not the same thing as variables in a preprocessor. And there was no appetite by the CSS working group to just give you the thing that CSS preprocessors can do because very frequently minus the couple of extra bytes across the wire, it is more efficient to do it in the preprocessor because then the CSS doesn't have to try to do it live 60 frames per second. Right. But what the reason that we did get it is because tab came up with this basically custom properties that, Hey, that's the thing that you can't do in a preprocessor because it's live. It's like, it is actually opens up new powers for you because it is live, you know? Yeah. And I think it's the same, especially with the custom functions because custom functions can like take a var and pass in the actual var, right? Like not a uh, already baked in value, but like whatever the value is for this now, I want you to pass to this function and, and figure this thing out. And so I think that's why it's really appealing. And I think somebody, maybe Florian actually even asked specifically that question, like said, Hey, 
uh, it's not always great for us to just do what preprocessor does because sometimes preprocessors are more efficient. So like, right. this is why we did it for custom properties and does the same hold true here. And yeah, it definitely does, especially I think for custom functions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, another thing that I personally was super excited about is anchor positioning. Oh yeah, there's so much on anchor positioning. I'm really, really excited about that. Yeah, there was a lot. Uh, but again, a lot of it was sort of weedy, not all of it. Yeah. So I wouldn't say anchor positioning is as far along as maybe view transitions, it's but it's, it, it's complicated, but it's, it's getting there. And you know, again, this is a thing that you can try out in Chromium, I think in Canary, I, th I think it's in Chrome, but you got to have the flag on anyway, there's been discussion around it and actually there's some new capabilities being added to it with anchor positioning until now. Like the way the spec was written, you could say, I want the top of this element to be lined up with the bottom of its anchor, or I want the, the inline end of this element to be positioned so that it's aligned with the inline end of its anchor. But you couldn't really size it with respect to the anchor. Well, you sort of could. You could try to say things like have both the inline ends line up with the inline ends of the anchor. But if you wanted it to sort of be aligned in certain ways with the anchor's element box, you would have to either do math or just sort of guess or whatever. And so this inset area is supposed to make that much easier where you can just say, I'm an element. This is my anchor. I want to be placed sort of in these boxes in relation to the anchor without having to say this edge goes with this edge and this edge goes with that edge you know, minus this amount or whatever, um, which is, is interesting. And I can see, you know, for things like pop-ups that go with a hyperlink, sort of like on Wikipedia, there are a lot of links that if you hover over them, there's a little pop-up box that shows you a preview of the Wikipedia page that that's pointing at. This inset area would make it very easy to just say, okay, I want my middle, like I want my horizontal center to align with the horizontal center of the anchor and then the rest just, you know, size yourself however. Yeah, and then, then it's tricky because, like, size yourself however can depend on, like, well, what kind of, what if how that much link space is, is there? bumped up against the very right edge? Yeah. What if the link actually breaks the line and is mm -hmm. on two lines? Mm -hmm. Then, like, where is your cursor? You know, it's not right. just the element. It's about where your cursor is on the element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so fascinating. I... This is one that, again, we should do a whole show on. And I, I would love to just do a show on the twists and turns of this because mm -hmm. um, this particular thing, I think, might have started in, like, 2018. Mm. And if my recollection is correct, it was Microsoft, actually, that did all the initial really heavy legwork on this. And I think, like, uh, I believe it was, like, Melanie Richards, who then was at Microsoft. And uh, then it kind of transitioned in open UI and like uh, Una invested a bunch into it and it's sort of like changed shape several times along the way mm -hmm. as you know we we think about these things and get new new eyeballs and all that but it, it it would be a fascinating show I think to do on on this and include some of the like the history of the shaping of this API yeah it's it's very interesting to me the ways that this has, you know, sort of expanded even in the last six months to a year, mm -hmm. right? Where as the implementation started to be an actual thing, like as, as these proposed specification was implemented in an experimental way, right? The rest of the working group was able to look at it and say, hmm, feel, we feel like there's a couple of things missing. Like there's a couple of capabilities that need to be added here. Or, wow, that is not what we thought was going to happen there. And we need to clarify what we're talking about. So, yeah, there was there was a lot of discussion. And again, like I say, a lot of it was in the weeds, was was sort of doing the, uh, the whole thing of, okay, given this kind of anchor in this kind of context, and then trying to position this other kind of thing with re in relation to it, like there are two possible answers here or more sometimes what does the working group think should happen 
but yeah, at, at, at the same time, there was also stuff like inset area, um, which is less perhaps it hasn't been implemented. So it's people haven't gotten quite as fall, far into the weeds about it, but I think that's coming. And it's, it's not a, like a huge, massive extension of concept. It's more of a creating a convenience property and value for authors, right? So that authors can get more quickly to just do this thing. And I, the rest of the details are maybe less important to me. Part of it was fallbacks, which is what you were sort of talking about, which was, I said the position underneath the anchor, but the anchor is practically at the bottom of the browser's viewport. Authors are able to define fallbacks like, okay, I want you to be underneath, but if there isn't enough room, go on top. And then if there isn't enough room there for some reason, maybe go to the inline start. And then if that doesn't work, try the inline end. And then if that doesn't work, then go back to the original thing that I said, because nothing works, right? There's not enough room right. for, for you anywhere. So just go where I originally said. And there, there's been work, like the way that fallbacks are expressed and the things that you can do in fallbacks, like got adjusted in this working group meeting. Okay. So another thing then that I wanted to uh, call out that happened there mm -hmm. was um, detail styling stuff. Um, so yeah. I have been pressing on for kind of a while that I feel like we have gotten some things a little bit wrong in the platform where we have some things that are like scroll bars. There's no like scroll pane element, right? We just say like this mm -hmm. element can become a scroller. We have a special element summary details, it, largely because that's what windowing toolkits do, you know, but windowing toolkits also have a scroll pane. So the trouble is that the answer to, do I want this to be summary details? Like for me is often like, it depends if I'm printing frequently, I'm like, no, I, I, I want that to always be open. You know, like I want to print that stuff. I just want to let it be collapsed because well on mobile, it just takes up too much space. And also I'd like to say like, it should be collapsed by default on mobile. There's like no way to do those things with summary details. It's like, you, you only can do it programmatically in the DOM or mm. through user interaction. And so I've wanted to think about this for a long time and I had some proposals on how to do it. And David Barron took it up um, and is carrying it across the finish line for details at least where, you know, the idea is that you can style a, a new pseudo element that is like the details content area. And you can say like, display block and like content visibility and it will be open and right. that's awesome. Uh, I think that there's probably some interesting questions still there because I don't know that it really becomes interactive or not. And if that is like problematic, but I'm so, so pleased that this is moving forward. So um, I think yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. One of the things that David showed that I think a lot of people would be very interested in is uh, with the details, you could uh, not only make it visible, but you could give it a height and then animate that height when people mm -hmm. click to open, right? So by default, maybe you're showing the first three lines of the details contents with maybe a, you know, a fade out, right? To make it all look all pretty. And then when you click on it to expand it, it just animates open, which I know people have wanted for a long time. A basically, long time. Versus details is like, why can't I animate this? Right? right. And they would literally show it. And here's how you would do that. So. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's, we, we were doing that with jQuery before. Yeah. yeah. You know, before there were even summary details, we were animating effectively disclosure widgets and not only animating them, but also you could make them so like, Oh, when it's print, you do like this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So in a way, and I think this is not infrequent actually, like in a way it's great that we got a standard because for a lot of things, that's all you need and it's fine. But frequently when we get a standard is like a step back in some cases, and then we have to kind of work to catch up. And that's not great, but it does seem to be like true. And it was true of summary details, I think. So this is awesome, like getting us back up to uh, 
to there. I, I wanted to note David Barron made this comment um, that uh, I actually wrote down because I just liked, I've never heard anybody say that before. So sometimes there are like, there's a little bit of hand weaviness in some of these. It's like, I haven't done this yet, but like, if mm. you, you just have to like squint at it and imagine, you know, he said, <laughs> um, uh, I'm probably an integer number of days from solving this. And then immediately a bunch of people uh, pointed out that integers can be very large. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But it just was funny because it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. In fact, yes, yeah, very cool. I mean, I know you were more excited because you've been working on it for longer and um, been much more invested in it. But yeah, just looking at what he was saying you could do and showing here are the three lines of CSS that would make this very simple. Um, yeah. Was was really, really cool. And the other end of things that I was really interested in that people have picked up and and been moving along rob flack presented and uh, i mean he and mia and probably some others who i am forgetting unfortunately but rob and mia have been driving this stuff that is under this banner that they're calling carousel but it's like mm. it's not really about carousel it's like if you wanted to make it possible to do a carousel here are the pieces that you would need or, or some pieces that we propose that you might need that would be like the building blocks for how you would make it possible to do this. And one of the things that is really, really super to me is the way that they broke it down doesn't only consider carousels. It takes into account a lot of the things that I talked about that are like, okay, so we have a bunch of components that have a lot of similarities. Like in our original panel set, we were like, okay, a panel set is, it can be tabs, it can be accordion, it can be a carousel. All of these are like very, very similar components. And carousels are not exactly tabs, most of them, but they can be almost like tabs. And so through the work that we did on like spicy sections, there's things that came out of that, especially discussions I had with Mia at CSS Working Group face-to-face -face in New York City in 2021, maybe? I don't know. But uh, that have to do with like fragmentation and overflow. And then also to that, uh, in 2019, we began talking to people about fragmentation and what the new generation of layout engines makes possible so we were talking about like, oh, remember all those things that were so cool about regions? Like now we could reconsider a lot of those. And remember all those things that like are almost about multi-call? We can probably start solving some of those. And so this proposal actually gets at so much cool stuff. I think that this is sort of the new, this is a new thing to get excited about, you know? Like, yeah. So with this, uh, you can sort of... Uh, overflow into things that you can scroll to you can overflow to like these different columns and create basically like pagination and, and markers that then you can become the things that you click on that drive the navigation and everything and, and do it all declaratively i'm i'm just i'm so floored by it like i'm really really excited so we're gonna start by putting things into the overflow five draft and Elika, Florian, Rob are gonna work on moving fragmentation stuff into it and work on paginate overflow and scroll markers. I'm just so excited about that one. Yeah. I think it's gonna be really cool. Cool. I think the other thing that was like interesting to me was there was a lot of discussion about find in page mm -hmm. or uh, selection. And those are, uh, related to the sorts of problems that I was talking about, right? So like if you create a carousel or tabs and you have like a paginated mm. thing, you know, this wasn't the nature of the conversation, but it, it is going to be related to those things. Like you don't think about that control F would want to find those, but it like it would, and maybe this approach helps solve that problem. So that was not the nature of the conversation, but I expect that we will get new, <laughs> like lots more on that. Yeah. So. And we should probably, 
well, at least I want to mention a few things that, that were unresolved. They were discussed but not resolved, or in a couple of cases, the working group ran out of time to talk about them. One of them was uh, what you were just talking about was it was a discussion about control whether an element is findable or searchable. Like in CSS, say whether or not control F or command F will find an element, which is fascinating. <laughs> is, is, is that presentation? Interesting discussion. Yeah, because to some extent you can yeah. today, right? Like if something is yeah. display none, it right. will not be found. So do you want more control over that? Um, a bunch of scroll bar issues were on the agenda, but they didn't get to them. Um, scroll bar right. styling is just one of those areas that perpetually comes up again and again. And this time it's just, you know, it sounds like, oh, they could have covered all this in a day. No, these discussions get very in-depth. We've very much been summarizing them. There was one about preserve 3D and backface visibility, and there just needs to be clarification about that. Not that many people use those. And then there was one, uh, there's a animation and anchored positioning. There are questions around that. Those did not get resolved. So that's a sort of another indication that anchored positioning is still being worked on, um, is not ready for prime time really yet. Um, but it is getting into that that's that's one of those things sort of in the weeds where anchor positioning is cool, but oh, what happens when we try to animate it? I'm sure there were other things as well. Again, we, we can't possibly do justice to three days of intense, very smart discussions in an hour, but we do our best. So, Nor would they probably be very interesting. <laughs> the, the, I mean, there is that. To most, to most people, yeah, most people be like, uh, okay, Brian made a joke that it was boring, but I am actually bored. But, you know, there are people who find this anything but boring. And most of those people were in that room. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and, and going back to a little bit to the very beginning, we can kind of bookend this a little bit with the, the comment that I was making about, like, you know, there are people who have dedicated, like, decades worth of their life gaining expertise and, and thinking around colors. The same is true around, like, internationalization or about, you know, fragmentation or layout or mm -hmm. paint performance yeah. or, and, and so, you know, really, really a lot of the discussion is the experts in the room talking amongst themselves. And they're, they're very frequently yeah. not the whole group, not that the whole group doesn't sometimes have opinions, but, you know, very frequently it's like, this is very, very deep stuff that requires a lot of background knowledge. And so... You know, not everybody yeah, is commenting exactly. on Exactly. Because in a lot of cases, I, I know this was true for me, and I'm sure it was true for you. There were discussions where it was like, I wish I understood enough of this to have an opinion. <laughs> like like yeah, you say, absolutely. like with the color, question. you know, how should we clip this? I was like, yeah, I don't know. Good, good question. I hope you guys figure out an answer. And in yeah. that case, they kind of didn't, but they're still working on it. So anyway, uh, yeah. I think that'll do for this week yeah that's of, that's of the big it, things right? the things that excited us yeah. um maybe we should make this a a, a tradition we'll do another one after the uh after the june face-to-face -face. well maybe Ooh. we could do one live okay that's an interesting idea live from the css working group face-to-face -face, but i'm sure we could get yeah, a lot could more be. guests <laughs> i have people mm. pop in and say hi all right, good Indeed. ideas to think about for the future. Let us know if you're a listener, if that sounds at all interesting or compelling to you. Yeah. Yeah. Alrighty. Thanks, Brian. All right. Thanks, Eric. See you.